I'm very pleased to have Yongho Yu from uh, Texas A&M. He was the uh, last student of Robin Thomas. And now he's a postdoc at Texas, with, uh, working with the Chunung Ru. And we talk about TSPs, right? All right. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Sanyo for giving me the opportunity to visit IBS. Okay, so this is uh, joint work with Michael Weigel and Xing Xing Yu, who are both, who are both at Georgia Tech. And the work was done while I was also at Georgia Tech. Okay, so I just want to start with the general traveling salesman problem formulation. So the, the general problem is given a complete graph G and edge distances between every pair of vertices, you want to find a tour or a spanning cycle of, of minimum total distance. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to, you have some set of cities and distances between the cities and you want to start somewhere, you want to visit all the cities and come back to your starting point and you want to minimize the total distance that you travel. Okay, so this is one of the classical problems in, in um, combinatorial optimization and it was maybe popularized in the, in the 1950s by um, Danzig who, who was developing tools for linear programming and they used their linear programming tools to solve the traveling salesman problem for uh, the cities. They, they chose one city out of each state in the United States. So at the, at the time, there were only 48 states. And they said solve is actually found the optimal solution, the optimal tour that visits each of the cities and comes back. Okay, and they, they, they solved this by hand, so they, they didn't really use computers at the time. So this was a big achievement, uh, and it became a famous problem. Right, so this is. Of course, it's one of the uh, notoriously difficult problems to solve, so it's NP hard to solve exactly. Okay? Of course, you can in encode the Hamiltonian cycle problem. So if you, give, if you give me some graph G, I can tell you whether or not there's a Hamiltonian cycle if I can solve this TSP problem. So let's just take a very simple graph. I just put weights 1 on the existing edges. For all the non-edges, I just put some, some weight that's higher than 1. Okay? And, and this graph has a tour of length exactly n if and only if it has a Hamiltonian cycle. Okay, so if you can solve the TSP exactly, then you can solve the Hamiltonian cycle, which is an NP-hard problem. Okay, in fact, it, you can't even approximate the TSP within any fixed constant factor. Okay, so let's say all I want is some solutions that's within a thousand factor of the optimal. Well, again, I just take, take a graph, put one on the existing edges, and on the, on the non-edges, I just put some huge weight, like 10,000. And again, I have a, a tour of length 1,000 times n, if, if and only if I have a tour of length n, right? Because as soon as I use any non-edge, I go above my, my threshold. Okay, so it's hard to approximate any, within any fixed constant factor. Okay, so because of this difficulty, well, um, people study uh, as slightly more specialized version of it where you can't have this very lopsided uh, weight distribution. Right, so one of the natural, or one of the more natural assumptions you can put on the TSP is to assume that your distances form a metric. Okay, and in, in this setting, all it means is that they satisfy the triangle inequality. Okay, so if you want to go from city X to Z, then you can't possibly get a shorter travel uh, by visiting some other city first and then going to your endpoint. Okay, so it's always at least better to travel directly to your, your, your to the, from X to Z. Okay, so the metric TSP is just the same problem with the additional assumption that your distance is satisfied this triangle inequality. So again, you can't solve this exactly, it's, it's NP-hard, because you can still encode the Hamiltonian cycle problem just in the same way as before. But now you can actually approximate it within a constant factor. So it's a classical and, and very elegant Combinatorial algorithm by uh, Christophides and, and around the same time, independently Serdukov, uh, they proved in the 70s that you can, there's a three halves approximation algorithm. So it's a very nice uh, and simple algorithm. So this is for the general metric TSP. Okay, so you, we have some nice constant approximation, but you can't hope to get uh, arbitrarily close to the optimal. So there's a constant factor, and you, if it, you, you, it's NP hard to get within a constant factor. This 123 over 122 factor of the optimal. Okay, so that's the currently best known in approximability result. Okay, so the metric TSP ha is it's a very natural problem, right? So, so in many real world applications, the metric, this triangle inequality does hold, for example, like the Euclidean 
TSD, where, where the distances that are actually the distance that you need to travel between cities, the triangle inequality always holds. So people study this problem a lot, but it's still very difficult. So uh, since the 70s, there was no improvement whatsoever on this three halves factor until very, very recently, which I'll discuss soon. But because it was so difficult, uh, people study even more special cases of the TSP, of the metric TSP. So one special case that I want to focus on today is what is called the graphic TSP. Okay, so here, I fix some connected graph H. So I have an underlying graph H. Then I take a metric completion of this graph. So what happens is I just add all the non-edges. But now the distance between any pair of edges is the length of the shortest path between the, those edges. Okay, so for example, here's, here's some underlying connected graph. So to get the metric completion, first of all, all, on all the existing edges, I put a weight or distance of 1, because between adjacent pairs, there's a, there's a path of length 1. And, all, and on all the non-adjacent edges, well, here, um, they all have distance 2. So I add all the non-edges, and I put a dis weight or distance of 2 on those. Okay, and this, uh, it's easy to check that this forms a, tr a metric, or it satisfies the triangle inequality. Okay, and if your metric TSP instance comes from some underlying graph like this, then we call it a graphic TSP. So it's a special case of the metric TSP, but now we can sort of think of it more graph theoretically. Okay, so the graphic TSP is just the metric TSP with the additional assumption that the, the distances come from some underlying graph. Okay, and so, so now you can actually forget about the weights or the distances you can formulate this equivalently as just finding a TSP walk, which is just a closed walk that visits all the, the vertices and comes back to your starting point. So the, the equivalent problem here is to just find a TSP walk of minimum length. Okay, so why do we care about the graphic TSP? So, of course, the metric TSP, I, I think we all agree that it's a nat very natural problem. Um, and it's a very natural condition to have uh, this triangle inequality, but this graphic TSP may, maybe not, right? It's, it seems very restrictive. It just seems like some special case that somebody came up with because to, to, it's easier. But there, there's a good reason that why we care about this graphic TSP. Yes? So is there any um, particular reason to uh you walk over H is connected to the graph? So, so if it's disconnected, then you, you can't really travel to the another component. Oh, I see. So you should think of it as having infinite weight or something like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So, so in this slide, I want to convince you that this there's a good reason to study this graphic TSP problem, even though it might not seem very natural uh, from a practical perspective. Okay, and and the reason is that one of the main ways to study the TSP problem is to look at the integer program. So you formulate it as an integer program, and, and one of the standard methods in combinatorial optimization is to relax it as a linear program. And then try to, you, you can solve linear programs efficiently, and you, you want to say something about the integral solution using this fractional solution. Okay, so let me give you the integral or integer programming formulation of the traveling salesman problem. Okay, so what I want to do is have a, a variable, let's see, flip, variable xe for every edge e, and I want to say, I'm, I'm going to set the variable to 1 if I use the edge in my tour and 0 otherwise. Okay, so it's just deciding whether or not I use e each edge. Okay, so here is the integer program formulation. What I want to do is to, to minimize, minimize the sum of the distances of the edges that I've used. Right? So, sorry, I can't. Right. Okay, so I, I want to minimize the, the sum of the, the distances of the edges that I've used. So, if xe is 1, then, I, then I've used it, and otherwise 0, so I, I don't contribute anything to this. Mm. Okay, but of course, I want to make sure that the edges that I've chosen form the tour. So the first condition is that for every vertex, I use exactly two edges around that vertex. Because a tour in the complete graph is just a, a Hamiltonian cycle, right? So it's a cycle that has all the vertices. So in particular, every vertex has two edges incident to its tour. So the first condition just says that it's too regular. But of course, if, if you just say too regular, you, you could have disjoint unions of cycles. So you also want to enforce that the, the, the set of edges that you chose uh, forms a connected graph. Okay, so the second condition says that for every subset of the vertices, there are at least two edges across 
the subset into the complement. Right, so now, now you've been forced that it's too regular and connected, so it, it is really a Hamiltonian cycle or, or a tour. And, and so this is an equivalent formulation of the traveling salesman problem. In the metric TSP, right? Not in. So, so I mean, this formulation works for, uh -huh. for general. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, if you assume the graph is complete. Okay, but of course, uh, integer programs are, sorry, are also NP hard to solve. So what we do is we relax this integer constraint to allow fractional solutions. Instead of just choosing 0 or 1, we allow some, something in between 0 and 1. So we have the same constraints, except we have this, you can have fractional solutions. So sorry, what, is, what does this delta S mean? Also, delta S means the set of edges that uh, have one endpoint in S and one endpoint outside of S. Yes. The integer version would it be equivalent in the second line there to have that connectivity? You could say just at least one instead of at least two. Yeah, it would be equivalent. Does it make a difference in the fractional when you do the fractional relaxation? Um, I I don't think so. Okay. I, I'm not not 100 percent sure. Yeah, yeah. I just was curious if there was like any intuition for which choice you should make there or if it mattered. It might be, I, th I think it's implicit. Okay. I'm not sure. I might be wrong. I think it might be. Just to double check this, when you say S is a subset of V of G, you mean a proper subset? Right. Yeah, right. So yeah, I meant to put uh, the proper subset. Uh -huh. All right, so yeah, here is a linear programming relaxation. And we can solve this efficiently. We can solve linear programming. Even though it has exponential many constraints, you can, you can solve this in polynomial time. But of course, what you'll get is might not be integers, right? You, you'll get some fractional solution. And one of the main problems in this area is to, is to sort of prove a guarantee on how close this fractional solution is to a, an actual real tour. So there's a very well-known um, conjecture from the, that's been floating around since the 80s. Uh, it's usually uh, uh, attributed to Gomans, but I think it's just I think something, that's something that many people came up with independently. That this, when you solve this linear programming relaxation, the fractional solution can't be too far away from the optimal. And in particular, the optimal integral solution is at most four-thirds away from the, from the fractional solution. Right? Because your fractional solution can get something smaller than the optimal integral solution, but the gap between them is at most further. So this has been a conjecture that's been floating around for quite a while, and it's, it's still open. OK, but why do people, why do we put four thirds here? Well, it turns out the only really tight example that we know comes from this graphic TSP instance. And in particular, it is, it's even more special. It's a subcubic graph. So the underlying graph is actually subcubic. Um, so here is a subcubic graph. So we want to sort of take the metric completion of this. Or just think of a TSP walk in this graph. So you want a closed walk, a spanning closed walk. So how many edges do you need to visit every vertex and come back to your starting point? Well, essentially, you need to cross these three long paths like four times, right? Because you want mm -hmm. to go across an even number of times, essentially. Mm -hmm. So if this, these three paths are very long, let's say 1,000 each, then <coughs> the shortest TSP um, walk would have length of about 4,000. OK, but with this fractional linear programming relaxation, here is a fractional solution. So you put one on all the long paths, but on these end triangles, you put halves. OK, so you can check that every vertex has um, exactly, like the, if you sum the weights of the edges around each vertex, you have exactly two. And, and you also satisfy this, this sort of fractional connected uh, condition. Okay, but the total, but the, the value of, the objective value of this fractional solution is about three times the length of the paths, or about 3,000. So the integral optimal solution is about 4,000, but the fractional optimum is about 3,000. And, and this is, um, the, as far as uh, I can tell, this, this is the only example that reaches this four-thirds gap in this, uh, in this, in this relaxation. Do you have a question? Uh, I was going to ask if it's the only example. Yeah, so, it, it, yeah. so I mean, there are, yeah. 
So I mean, this doesn't reach four thirds exactly. It just approaches four mm -hmm. four thirds um, asymptotically. But it, it is the only example that we know of. Yeah. Okay. So this is really the main reason that people study the graphic TSP, and in particular the, the, the subcubic graphic TSP. So even though it's, a, it's really a special case of a special case of a special case, if I even think it's it's too specialized, but people do study this particular subcubic graphic case quite intensively. Okay, so, so what is actually known about the graphic TSP and the subcubic graphic TSP? Well, okay, so first of all, they're all NP-hard, but they're all special cases of the metric TSP, so you can, there's a three halves uh, approximation just by the, the general algorithm of Christopher Eason. Okay, and these are all also not, you cannot approximate them arbitrarily close. So they, there's some constant gap where you can't get closer to it uh, unless E is equal to NP. Okay, so these are all, these are the negative results. But what improvements have been made? Okay, so again, the, the, the classical algorithm three halves approximation is from the 70s. Okay, and there was no improvement on any of these non-trivial uh, cases until 2005 where they just broke below three halves by a little bit. And, and this was even the even more special case of three connected kind of cubic graphic TSP. Okay, but this was, at the time, it was uh, considered a big breakthrough because <coughs> this was really the first non-trivial case where you broke below three halves. Okay, and, and after this, uh, once you break through this, this barrier, there, there, there's been a, a sort of a flurry of results. So um, for, for the more general case of the general graphic TSP, after this, they also broke this three halves barrier for the general graphic TSP. Okay, and this has been improved uh, in a sequence of papers, and currently the best uh, approximation ratio is 7 fifths, so about 1.4. But of course, people, people believe that you should be able to do 4 thirds, or 1.3. Do you know if all these algorithms are using similar techniques, or like what the... So, um, so what, what I know is that in this paper, they had some new technique, but the analysis was very complicated. And Mucha showed that the exact same algorithm actually just gives you this better approximation just by better analysis of the algorithm. Okay, and here they were using, so here they were doing some, some sampling, random sampling mm -hmm. types of results. But here it was, this was more combinatorial using like T-joints. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's, this is the current state of the art for the graphic TSP. Okay, and the, the more general metric TSP, there was nothing known until uh, just a few years ago. Uh, they also broke through this three halves barrier by a very, very tiny amount, but this is again <laughs> considered a, a, a big breakthrough. So um, there was a, a, a lot of uh, news about this, this result. Okay, so this is uh, sort of the more general uh, cases. So, what about the more specialized cases of cubic and subcubic graphic TSP? Okay, so again, this is the first breakthrough for any of these metric TSP instances. Okay, and of course, after that, people improved this, and they actually gave a fourth there's approximation for cubic TSP, and then this was improved to more general subcubic TSP. Right. Okay, and maybe people thought four thirds is like a natural barrier there, right? But then they actually show that for the cubic TSP, you can you can go beyond four thirds. You can you, you can you do even better. So they broke the four thirds sort of barrier by a tiny amount, and then after that, there's going to a few more results, so for 1.3 approximation, and more recently, 9 seventh approximation by Dvorak, Krall, and Mohar. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's about 1.28. Okay, and this is where, where we come in, and we give a slightly better 5 fourths approximation for the cubic TSP. Mm -hmm. So, a, I mean, it is a small improvement, but I think, so what we do is we actually prove a more general result on subcubic graphs, and we just get this result as a, as a easy corollary, and I think uh, maybe the more important uh, aspect of our work is that we gain a better understanding of the subcubic graphic TSP, because that's really what uh, people care about. Okay, so this is really the, the background of, of our work. So if there are any questions about the background, uh, now's a good time. Wait, by 2023, you mean? <laughs> it, well, I mean we proved it like a year ago, but it just, it just got published. I see. Is there like any other interesting results in the randomized? Like these are all deterministic algorithms? So actually a lot of these still use some randomized um, techniques. So mm -hmm. but, is the, but the result, like the actual running of the algorithm is deterministic? Um, 
No, so I guess it is still, they're still uh, randomized. So they, they sample a random. Yeah. Maybe I don't phrase my question well. I mean, like, does it get 1.3 approximation almost surely? Like with probability, yeah. blah, blah, yeah. blah. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. <laughs> But actually, I, that's, it's a good question because I should mention that our algorithm doesn't use any randomizer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely deterministic. It, it's just completely, just purely graph theoretic, uh -huh. which is, I mean, whether or not that's a good thing is depends on who you ask. <laughs> yeah. some, some, some random question. <laughs> 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 so they made the symmetric TSP uses a triangular inequality. Yes. But another kind of version of triangular inequality comes from ultrametry, where instead of using plus use, use the maximum of the two, mm -hmm. which I think is very okay. strong condition. Of course, yeah. it's maybe useless, but do people consider TSP questions under the assumption that we have ultrametry? Yeah, I, 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 have, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that seems like an interesting uh, problem. Mm -hmm. Like, I could see where that, that could be useful. So, mm -hmm. But I, I don't know if people have looked at it. If you have a solution for cubic graph, then do you automatically get a solution for like four regular graphs, five regular graphs? No, so, so I mean, w one of the open problems that I'll mention at the end is can we generalize our techniques to like graphs of degree at most k uh -huh. and get some anal analogous uh, approximation for k regular graphs? I, I, it's, there's a good chance that it's possible, but it will get a lot more technical. Like our paper is already quite technical, the calculations. There'll be a lot of case analysis, but that's there's a good chance that that's possible. Okay. Any, any other questions? Okay. So let me give you the our main theorem state statement. It's buzzing. Okay. So here here is our main theorem statement. So let TSPG denote the minimum length of a TSP block in, in a connected graph G. Okay, so our main theorem is that if G is a simple two-connected subcubic graph with n vertices and let n2 denote the number of vertices of degree 2. Okay, then we just show just a general upper bound on the length of a TSP block. So we can find a TSP block of length at most 5n plus n2 over 4 minus 1. Okay, so in particular, if G is cubic, so if it doesn't have any vertices of degree 2, then just N2 is 0, so we get a TSP walk of length 5N over 4, minus 1. Okay, and, and, and from the proof, we can, we can find the TSP walk in, in polynomial time, in fact, it's quadratic time. So of course, this just gives us a quadratic time algorithm to, if you give me a cubic graph, I can find you a TSP walk in quadratic time that has length 5N over 4. Okay, so this was this statement was conjectured by Dvorak, Kral, and Mohar in their paper where they proved this nine seventh approximation. So they, I think they, they tried to prove this, but um, it got a little difficult, and they, they settled for nine seventh. And but I, I think uh, a lot of the credit is due to them because it, I mean it's a very nice statement, and th the really nice thing about this is that this bound is best possible. So there's something really nice about having like this exact bound. Uh, which allows us to prove using uh, like a stronger induction hypothesis. So I think a lot of the work is coming up with really the right statement. Uh, so I think a lot of credit is due to them for coming up with the statement. And, and we, were, we were able to prove this. So this is best possible. So for example, there are infinitely many subcubic graphs that meet this um, bound exactly. Okay, but you might, you might say we can maybe play with the coefficients between n and n2 a little bit. Um, but if you, if you focus on cubic graphs, so even when you restrict to n to being zero, there are infinitely many cubic graphs that satisfy this bound. So I mean, this is one away from the optimal, but the constant, the coefficients, you can't change. Okay, and, and what's more is that we, we don't just prove this upper bound, we can characterize exactly when we meet this bound um, with equality. Okay, so to prove this, we use a notion of even cover. So this was also something that um, Borja, Kral, and Mohar came up with. So an even cover of a subcubic graph is just a spanning vertex of string union of cycles and, and isolated vertices. Okay, so just 
So okay, let me just give you the picture first. So here's a subcubic graph. Okay, so here is some spanning disjoint union of cycles and isolated vertices. You should just think of it as a, some union of cycles and all the remaining vertices you take as isolated. Okay, so given such an even cover, we define the excess of an even cover as two times the number of cycles plus the number of isolated vertices. Okay, so the reason we define it this way is, is the excess somehow counts the number of vertices that you have to repeat. Okay, so there's a natural correspondence between even covers and, and TSP walk. It's, it's not a bijective correspondence, but here is the correspondence. So if you, if you give me an even cover like this, you can think of it as a bunch of connected components. You just connect them by some kind of a spanning tree. It doesn't matter how you connect it. Just connect them by any spanning tree. So just let's think of this inductively. So let's say I have some closed walk somewhere before, and I want to add a cycle. So if I have some closed walk and I add a, add a cycle, how many vertices would I have to repeat to just include this cycle in, into my walk? Well, I started here somewhere, and I, I would have to come to this cycle and come back and repeat this vertex and also repeat the vertex where I left my, my, the walk that I started with. So I repeat two vertices. But if I add a, an isolated vertex, so I start with some closed walk, but I add this isolated vertex, well, I have to go there and then come back. So I don't repeat anything here, but I have to repeat the vertex where I, I left. So it, this gives me one more repeated vertex. So this is why we add two for each cycle, and one for each isolated vertex. Okay, so here I have an even cover. I have three cycles and I have four isolated vertices. So the excess of <coughs> the even cover is 10. And just no matter how you connect them into the spanning tree, you, you can show that um, I get a TSP walk of, of length exactly. So there's an exact relation between the excess of the even cover and the TSP walk that I get by just connecting those the components. Okay, so I mean the, the exact formula is not so important, it's just what matters is that there's an exact relation. So finding the, the TSP walk of minimum length is actually equivalent to finding an even cover of minimum excess. Okay, so this is what we actually do. We, we, we find an even cover of minimum excess. Okay, so here is our actual main theorem. We to, to, so we just reformulate it using this, using this uh, correspondence. So what we prove is that Given a two kinds of subcubic graph with n vertices and n two vertices of degree two, I can find some even cover which has excess at most n plus n two over four plus one. Then, if you just plug it, plug this into the formula or for the correspondence, you just get back um, the previous statement for TSP walks. Okay, and moreover, this even cover can be found in quadratic time. All right. So here is our again our main main theorem. So let me briefly give you a very general um, overview of how we approach this, this proof. Okay, so what we want to do, so this is a purely graph theoretical uh, proof. So we're going to prove this by induction, essentially. So to do an induction, we want to actually come up with a stronger statement, right? So what we want to do is, okay, let's say I have a subcubic graph and, an, and a specified edge E. I want to say, okay, can I, can I get an even cover that contains my specified edge in one of the cycles. Okay, so can I get the same bound if I'm forced to contain some edge? Well, the answer is no, because here's an example. So my, my specified ed edge is this middle edge. Okay, and if I want an even cover containing this edge, then I really need a cycle or a triangle plus some isolated vertex, which gives me an excess of three. But if I just plug this n plus n2 over four, well, I have a four plus two over four, which is three halves. So I don't have a plus one, I have a plus three halves. So it violates our it desired bi bound by one half. Okay, but I mean, that's not so bad, right? it's just, just one half. What if I give you an edge, but I force you to not contain the edge in my even cover? Then maybe we can get, a, get this bound in that case, but the answer is again, no, because here's another example. If, if I'm forced to not contain this edge, then again, my, I, 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 um, my even cover has to contain one cycle and one isolated vertex. Okay, so again, my excess is three. But again, my n plus n2 over four is three halves. So I again violate the bound by one half. So in both cases, uh, the bound, the, it could be violated by one half. But the key observation here is that, okay, so here in the first case, 
this was bad if I was forced to go through the edge. But here, but now, if I allow you to not go through the edge, then I can actually get do much better. I can get a cycle. I can cover the whole graph with one cycle. Mm -hmm. Similarly, here, this was bad if I was forced to not use this edge. But if I now, if I'm now allowed to use the edge, then I can have to again get cover the whole graph with one cycle. Mm -hmm. So if I'm really bad with respect to one condition, then I can do, actually do a bit better, better than the bound, um, in in the other with the other condition. So this is our, really our, our key observation. That if you give me a graph G and a specified edge E, then if I look at the, the two sort of additive constants that I get by forcing it to go through the edge or not through the edge E, then the two additive constants actually balance out in a sense. Okay, so what we do is we actually prove two separate bounds. So if I'm forced to go through the edge, I prove this upper bound. If I'm forced to not go through the edge, I prove this upper bound. Okay, and then we show that we did these two additive constants balance out. Okay, and moreover, we can characterize both of the extremal cases. So in both, if I'm go forced to go through the edge, I can tell you exactly when I'm at this worst possible case, and then similarly for the other, other case. Okay, so here is our actual uh, main statement. So we're just adding more and more information in the, in the statement yeah. theorem <laughs> so that we can like, use this in, in our in induction. Okay, so let G be a simple like subgeometric graph, and I have a specified edge E. Okay, so just forget about this connectivity condition. Then if I'm forced to contain the edge, my specified edge in my even cover, then I, I can give you an upper bound of plus 3 half. Okay, so it's a half worse than the plus 1 that we wanted. And similarly, if I'm forced to not contain the specified edge in my even cover, then I, I again get an upper bound of plus 3 halves. Moreover, there's a balancing condition that um, if I just look at the two additive constants, they sum up to at most two, right? So I mean, in the worst case, I have a three halves plus three halves. Maybe in the worst case, you might get a three, but no, we can, we can put that that doesn't happen. So if I get a three halves on, on one side, then I get a one half on the other side, and, and vice versa, which is better than the one that we want. Okay, so again, we characterize all, all, all the graphs and this, the edges that um, meet each of these inequalities. Exactly. Okay, and, and we give a special name to the, the graph that satisfy this bound um, exactly, which means it's sort of it is sort of the worst possible in, in both instances. Um, so we say that this pair is tight. Okay, and, and the fact that we get a two here is, is we I think is very lucky because two is exactly the excess of one cycle. Okay, so what happens is we I'll, I'll show you a picture later, but this two is. is um, very fortuitous. Okay, so also note that this n plus n2 over 4 is always half integral. So there's basically like three um, types of extremal cases uh, for, the, for the tight classes. Okay, and, and of course we classify all of those. Okay, so let me try to describe this, these tight examples. So here's a very simple operation. I start, if I have a vertex of, of degree 2, and I just blow it, blow, up, blow it up into a four cycle, like this. So what happens if I do this blow up? Well, the excess always goes up by one, no matter we, with, whether I go through this degree two vertex or not, because if I was going through this, so if I had an even cover that went through this vertex of degree two, then I can route that cycle through one of these vertices and I just add one isolated vertex. So that gives me an extra isolated vertex, so the excess goes up by one. In the other case, if, if this was an isolated vertex, then I just replace it with a cycle. So the isolated vertex gives me one, but I replace a cycle which gives me two, so the excess goes up by one. Okay, and also the number of vertices goes up by three, and the number of uh, degree two vertices goes up by one. So the n plus n two over four go also goes up by one. So doing this operation doesn't really change any of the tightness conditions. Okay, and we say that a graph is H constructible if it can be obtained from some starting graph H by just some sequence of, of these diamond operations. So here's, here's an example. So, here's, so here, here was one of the bad examples if you were forced to go through this edge, right? And we have these two degree two vertices, and you can just iteratively, iteratively apply this diamond operation. So here I apply the diamond operation to the bottom, bottom vertex, I get this four cycle, and then I apply it to this top vertex. But I can do this iteratively, so I, can, I, get, a new, I get new vertices in degree two, I can apply here, and I can apply here and so on. So these are all the graphs that
can be constructed uh, from K4 minus an edge using this operation. Okay, and, and, and here I should mention that, so, um, yeah, so we, we classify or we characterize all the extremal cases, and this is, this is not just some extra nice thing that we get on top of the proof, we actually need these extremal examples in the inductive statement of the proof. So actually our real main statement of the, of the theorem has to, uh, like, we need the characterization in the statement of the, of the theorem. So here is again the statement from before, but we actually need more information in, in, in the theorem. So the three inequalities that we had before, but we can, we can say that the third inequality is satisfied with equality if and only if G and E comes from one of these uh, three cases, or, or one of these four cases. So K4 minus is just uh, this example, K4 minus an edge, with E being this middle edge. K23 is just K23, and E could be anything, is symmetric. And here I call this a K4 plus, because it's a K4 with one edge subdivided. It's, it's not very good notation, but, but the edge has to be this edge here. So this was an example where if you were forced to not go through the edge E, then the, you, you violate the inequality. So these are the three sort of bad examples, or, or the tight examples. And all the graphs that you obtain by diamond operations on these examples are also tight. And there's one sort of exceptional uh, case of K4. Uh, so on, on K4, you can't do any diamond operation because it doesn't have any purposes of the <coughs> OK, but what we, what we prove is that um, the pair G and E is tight, or it satisfies a third inequality, um, if and only if you're, you're one of these classes. You're constructible from any one of these four graphs. OK, mm -hmm. and what about this second inequality? So if I'm forced to not go through this edge, then I, I satisfy this. Um, that I, have a, I have a plus 3 halves. And what we, what we show is that we satisfy this equality, or if, in the worst case, this happens if and only if g minus e is k23 constructible. So for example, here I have g and my edge e that I'm not supposed to use. So you can just sort of just think of it as deleting the edge e. Right? So if I delete the edge e, I get this. So if I start with this, I blow it up with diamond operations however you want, and then just add an edge back so that it's subcubic, then that forms a tight example to the, to the second inequality. And those are the only ones. OK, and now the first one is a bit more complicated. So here, if I'm forced to go through this edge e, then the worst examples are the graph that looks something like this. Okay, so you, I have my edge e, and I have these like sort of long chains of things that are sort of balanced. So no matter, so essentially what I have to do is go through this edge e and then go down. My cycle has to contain either the bottom chain or go through the top chain. Like I have to make this choice. So if I go through this bottom, so if any of these choices are better than the other, then I can I just go through that. I use that, and I, I'm. I, I'm not the worst case, so these sort of chains have to be balanced in some sense. And then each of these blocks, when you sort of look at it indiv individually, they also have to be tight. Because if they're not tight, if, they're, if these are not sort of satisfying this inequality exactly, then you, it means you can save a little bit by going through it or not going through it. Okay, so this is, I won't give you really the full definition, but this is essentially what happens. So just think of this as two long paths. Right. Too long past the same one. Okay, so th this is our characterization, and and this gets a bit recursive because, well, what is it? <coughs> so if I if I'm forced to go through this edge, then each of these chains are balanced, but and each of these blocks are tight. Okay, but what does it mean for this block to be tight? And I have to look at inside here, and I what I do what we do is we, we just sort of look at each of these blocks individually and add this. Um, edge and look at, we, if, if you wanted to go through this, this chain, then we, we, it's equivalent, equivalent to say, I just add this edge and make it go through this edge, and then, and then I get another decomposition like this, and it can go down recursively. Okay, so that, that's really our main theorem. Our actual main theorem in the paper is slightly, has slightly more information, but I, I, uh, I won't. <laughs> I don't know if it fits on the slide. But. Okay, so let, let me just pause here a little bit. So let, let's just uh, recap what, what we have so far. We have this very complicated statement with all of the information that we could pack into it so that we could have this strong inductive hypothesis for the proof to go through. 
All right, so in particular, so what happens? Um, well, we, we don't re actually care in the beginning, we don't care about whether you, we go through this edge or not, right? All we care about is having some short or even cover with small excess. So if I'm at three halves, if I'm forced to go through an edge and at, at three halves, that means because of this last inequality, I can, go, I can get a plus one half by not going through the edge and vice versa. So if I don't care, if I just want a general even cover, then the worst case is when in both of the first two cases, whether or not I'm forced to use the edge or not, I'm at a additive constant of plus one in both cases. Okay, so when does this happen? We also like to classify this in, our, in, the, in the paper. So the only time this happens when the additive constants are both plus one is when G is exactly isomorphic to K4 and or constructible from K to K. These are the only cases where it merges. So in particular, the, every simple two-connected subcubic graph has an even cover of excess at most this. And if the minimum excess is exactly this, then you are either K4 or K2 through constructible. Okay, and, and j just to go back to our, our starting point, uh, just by trans the translation between even covers and TSP walks, if you give me a two-connected subcubic graph, then I can find you a TSP walk of length at most 5n plus n2 over 4 minus 1. Okay, and, and in the worst case, this, this is the best you can do if and only if you're either K4 or constructible from K2 through. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, we, we really need this sort of complicated statement to make this proof go through. But, I mean, in the end, this, this, is, this is what we want. Okay, so any questions about the statement of the theorem? Why do you emphasize the simpleness? Oh, okay, so it, it's not true if you allow parallel edges, because I mean the, the bad cases are when you have like, um, just imagine that these are very long paths, or, but because if you have a long path, you have a lot of degree two vertices, so that contributes a lot to your, make your bound, sort of easier to, <coughs> because the upper bound that you have goes up. You have a lot of degree two vertices. But if you allow parallel edges, just think of these as parallel edges, then you're just destroying all of your degree two vertices without making it any easier to find a small e cover. Yeah, so if, if you allow parallel edges, then just none of these things are true. Although I mean, it might be possible to come up with some analog or some refinement where you allow parallel edges and you do a count based on the number of, number of parallel edges. one point. So from the theorem, in order to obtain the corollary, do you have to you, have, I mean, you might have a two connected graph without having an edge whose division is two connected. Right, okay, so I, I'll, I'm about to discuss that in <laughs> the next slide, I think. Okay, so I mean, what, so why do we need this condition? Because if G minus E is not, I mean, we really only need this for the second case because we're, if we're forced to not use the edge, well then deleting the edge better have, better not have a bridge or a cut edge, mm -hmm. right? So, but it, this is really not a, a serious condition because if G minus E is not too connected, then you, you, your edge is in some number of two edge cuts. So it has to look something like this, some, some, number, some big chain that goes around. Okay, then a cycle contains this edge if and only if it contains all of these edges. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't contain this edge if and only if it doesn't contain any of these edges. So what we can do is we just break this up into these, each of these blocks. So for each of these blocks, again, we delete these two edges and we just join them like this for each of these blocks. Uh -huh. And we just solve it recursively. So this, this is not really a serious condition. Uh, when you add those, then you no longer, and you might create the parallel edges. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so that, that's the part that I, I sort of hit in our main statement <laughs> here. So when we do this, we might get one parallel edge next to the specified edge. Right. And then we also like characterize exactly when these are like tight. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it will need like three or four lines to like write down exactly what, what happens there.
Okay, so yeah, so the, the condition that g minus e is two connected is, is not, not the source. You can just do it recursively with some technical difficulties. Okay, so let's, let's not worry about that. So l let me just show you the rough idea for the first inequality. So that, that's really the main uh, part of the proof. So I'm forced to go through this edge. And there's, we just look at the, the graph. It's subcubic, so we can say a lot about what it looks like. So there's, here's one easy case. I have my specified edge E, and if I delete the two endpoints, then the graph becomes disconnected. Okay, so in that case, because the graph is subcubic, it just has to look something like this, right? I mean, there might be just like one block here, or it might be just like a long path, but it has to look like some, uh, there has to be some kind of a chain here and some kind of a chain here in, in, this, in this case. Okay, in this case, it's, it's essentially what we discussed before. So if it's better to go through this chain, then we go through it and we actually save a little bit. If it's, if it's sort of balanced, then we, we, we just, because of this balanced condition, we satisfy this inequality. So no matter, it doesn't really matter which, which route you take, you, 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 we're, we're still okay because of this third inequality. Okay, so that's the easy case. If G minus UV is not disconnected, so if it's still connected, then again, just because it's subcubic, it has to look something like this. Okay, and let me just point out that um, the way we get this K4 is we just by doing a bunch of uh, case analysis, what we get is that th this chain has to be trivial, or is just a single edge. This block has to be trivial. All of these ed chains have to be trivial, and these blocks have to be trivial and, like, as a single vertex. So if you just do that, you, you get exactly K4. That's how we get K4. Okay, so it, yeah, essentially, uh, these chains. So, what we, so in this case, what we, what, what do we do? We have to go through this edge. So there's essentially like, like, like two choices here. Right? So I can either go through here, come back this way, and then not go through this chain and not go this, this, this chain. Or I can go through this chain and then come around here and go through this chain and then not go through these chains. Okay, so in, in every step, there's like a choice for which sort of chain you want to go down in your, with your cycle and which, chase, which chain you leave out. So there's al always a choice to be made here. And this actually makes the algorithm a little bit non-trivial. But I mean, but just with like three pages of calculations, you, you can and with this like inequalities, you, you can just show that you you can make this work. Okay, and, and a similar thing here is that it's slightly more complicated because you have a bit more choices. So you want to use this edge UV. You can either go through this chain and come through this chain, or you can go through this chain and come through here. So there, there's four choices, and you got to basically just using this balanced inequality, you got to add like all of them and then divide. And you just show that like the average is not too bad. Okay, and, and here you have to sort of say, well, I mean, it could be bad, but if it's really bad, then it has to be something has to be tight. And be, if it's tight, we know exactly what it looks like. And what, when we know what it looks like, we can do a slight improvement, or something like that. So it, it, the proof is quite technical. It's, I mean, the rough idea is, is just, just this, but the actual details are a bit technical. Okay, so that, that's the, the rough idea. Right, so let me just ask. So I have a quick okay. simplification. So how do you find the candidate of the graph that satisfies equality? How do you find the candidate? Uh, like, you know, the list of the uh, You're graphs. asking about the proof strategy? Like, yeah, how yeah. did you come up with those? How do we, how do we come up with the, yeah, the yeah. graphs? <laughs> well, I mean, we, we, we found, I mean, so we knew that this was like the sort of you know, uh, a bad thing, right? You can force to go through this edge. And we were just thinking of like paths. Mm -hmm. If you have two long paths the same length, it doesn't matter which one you go through, it, 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 so it still violates this. So this inequality is, becomes three halves, no matter which side you go through. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then you get this, re but you could have blocks and you can, because we knew of this diamond operation. So you, you get a recursive structure uh, and then, I mean, we, so this recursive circuit is what we knew, like we knew that all of the tight example, well, all everything you can that's constructible from like these simple bad examples, mm. we knew had to be like one of these extremal cases, and then we just guessed that those were the only ones, <laughs> and it just worked out. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I mean, this is really why I, I think a lot of credit is due to the uh, to Roger Claude Moore because they really came up with the, I mean, they didn't come up with the extremal examples, but they came up with this conjecture bound. And I mean, I mean, the bound itself is. Uh, it, I, I think it's a very nice problem to begin with because everything worked out nicely, even though like the actual proofs are a bit technical. We can 
really the, the, the structure of the extreme examples really just show up in the proof recursion. Okay. okay, yes? Is it surprising they guessed the right bound if you would say they did not have like the sharp examples? So, I mean, so they also, they came up with the sharp examples that meets this n plus n two over four bound. And they, they conjecture that it's the right bound. And I mean, they prove it in some like special cases, but they couldn't make the entire proof. They, they had to settle for nine sevenths. Yeah, then their bound was not right. But I said now, like you also mentioned, they did not come up with the sharp examples. Right, but they conjectured the, the, the bound. Yes, but so that's my question was about the surprise that they conjectured the right thing without conjecturing yeah, the, right. yeah. the constructions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, okay, so they had the. They gave a they, the infinite uh, family of examples that are tight for their bound conjecture bound, and those are essentially the only uh, extremal examples, essentially. Ah, so you're saying that there were more tight examples, but they didn't. Is that what? You mean? Yeah, but like, but but what they had was essentially the right idea. Okay, so the algorithm is basically you, you do it off the proof. So again, there's two algorithms. One, I, I, you give me a graph and an edge, I give you an even cover containing the edge, or another algorithm that gives you an even cover not containing the edge. Okay, so I mean, you just follow the proof, but the, the problem is that there's a lot of choices to be made. Right, so for example here, like, there's sort of four choices on, on what to do, and you have to decide, you can't just try all four possibilities. So you, when you, when, once you choose one uh, choice, uh, you have to do it recursively. Right? You can't do this for all, all the choices. So what we do is we sort of just get a worst case estimate of how bad these chains could be. You can, you can do that in linear time. Um, and then just choose one that we know is not going to be worse than the, the, the worst possible. So there's a bit of work showing that we, we, we can do this in, we can decide in linear time uh, a path to, path to go down in this recursive tree that's not going to be worse than our the worst possible bound. Okay, so I won't really go through the thing, but we just get a worst case estimate, we can do this in linear time, and then we just do it recursively, so number first just goes down by two, so it's a quadratic time algorithm. Okay. Okay, so just to summarize, this, this is our main theorem, okay, and, and just really the, the main theorem is that we can this is just it's just a graph theoretical upper bound, right? This is, if you give me a simple two point associated graph, then we just know that the, there is some TSP block of length at most five plus n to over four minus one. And in particular, if you just give me a cubic graph, this algorithm will give you something as five n over four. Okay, so of course the, the next question is, this is just an upper bound. The lower bound is just a trivial bound of n, right? Because we know every spanning cycle has mm -hmm. to have n edges. So we don't really do anything non-trivial in, in the lower <laughs> bound, right? We, we just prove an upper bound and we just say, okay, it's five n over four. So, I mean, there, there should be a way to get some sort of a better approximation ratio by having a better comparison of the lower bound and the upper bound, but we, we don't really know how to do that and get any sort of non-trivial lower bound at this point. So, I, I mean, I, I, I believe that this could be slightly improved beyond five fourths if we can sort of get a better argument for a lower bound. And of course, we, we, we want to sort of generalize our ideas because, you know, like, like we said in the introduction, Many of the proofs or approximation algorithms in, in with these sorts of problems have some random sampling algorithms, but ours is just, just purely just graph theoretic. And I, 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 this is like an approach I think people have not uh, explored too deeply. So um, it, it may be possible to just sort of go through with, um, push this sort of idea further to get more uh, better approximation ratio for more general graph plots. Yes, yeah, so I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? I thought there were some conjectures, so in which case I uh, have to be careful, but like if you have cubic two connected and maybe something else, then like the, the graph should be Hamiltonian, so then you cannot improve the end. 
right? So, so I, I know be, three connected cubic graphs can be non-Hamiltonian. Yeah, I know. Like, yeah, I mean, there with some additional conditions. Like yeah. actual three? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, so I mean, one of my, Michael Weigel and Xing Xing, they, they both really work on Hamiltonian cycles. Mm -hmm. And somebody suggested to them, really, this TSP problem, because it's related to Hamilton. So they really know a lot about mm -hmm. Hamiltonian cycles. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah. I, I know they, they have worked on problems like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be only for bipartite and the other two conditions. Mm -hmm. Like, if with some additional conditions, it's Hamiltonian, and also it's not that surprising if you don't have these additional conditions, maybe, like, you are not that far. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so like one line of research that is like people do in, in that <coughs> direction is to just find a long cycle. So if you have a three connected cubic graph, what's the longest cycle you can take? Mm -hmm. uh, this is sort of a different relaxation, right? We're <laughs> keeping the spanning condition, but we're relaxing the cycle condition. Mm -hmm. So it's like sort of the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. You know about do they get something like three and over four or? What? So I think it's it's not linear, actually. Oh. There are three connected cubic graphs uh, where the, the longest cycle is like n to the 0.9 or something. Some, some okay, kind of okay. Mm -hmm. so, so for a larger degree graph, do you have some conjecture value for PSP of G? I, I did. Uh, I'm not sure if I remember. the the bound, but so the first problem is we have to we have to, we have to um, change what, what we mean by an even cover because the reason we define even covers this way was because of this correspondence between even covers and JSP walks. Mm -hmm. But if, now, if you have um, degree four vertices, let's just say four regular or max degree four, then you need to allow um, sort of like these figure eight types of basically Eulerian walks. Right. Right? And in the bounds you get are so we need to change what you mean by excess, because you you, have, you can have cycles, you could have isolated verses, you, but you could also have other Eulerian walks. Okay, so what what I think you need to do there is to just count the number of repeated vertices in your Eulerian like each component. You either a cycle or you have some repeated vertices in your Eulerian walk and count those and you you should get a dis different constant in your excess. And then you can sort of generalize this to um, get some analogous bound um, and I thought about it a little bit and I think it's it might be possible to get a more general like upper bound for TSP walks in like let's say max degree k graphs but the case analysis will definitely blow up so. okay. Thank you. does your proof have a ton of case analysis yes yeah I mean like the, the main statement I gave you was not even the, the full statement, right? <laughs> How many pages? So the proof, it was about 30 pages. And the whole paper is about 30 pages. Because mm -hmm. what happens is, okay, we, we go recursively, like not in this case. Like in this case, we, like there, there, we, 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 <laughs> we look at the two choices that we can recurse on. But then each, like here, you have to, you add this edge, but you, so you, if you want to go through here like this, you add this edge and you delete this edge, mm -hmm. but now like this thing might not be sort of tight, mm -hmm. so it's sort of close to tight, and you want to, and because you have this extra vertex of degree two, you're not allowed to, like, right? So you have to analyze what it looks like, mm -hmm. and we, we use our extreme characterizations to say, okay, because it's like almost tight, it has to look something like this, mm -hmm. and then if it looks exactly like this, then we can just sort of do something slightly different to get something better. Your graph doesn't have too many vertices of degree four. Let's say my graph is almost subcubic except one vertex or except two vertices. Mm -hmm. Is there a chance that you can still uh, <laughs> approximate things? So then, I mean, if you if you have a constant number, then I think you can just split them, right? Ah, okay. But if a number of vertices grows more than I see, so then right, probably you split and then maybe worse. Yeah, just check, check all the possible ways to split it. Right.
And uh, finding an even cover with the minimum excess is also a bit complete in general? Yeah, right? I mean, it's yeah, equivalent because it's to the GSP. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker.